Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so my name is Parham. You cannot see me because I'm sharing my screen. Um, so you can always find outdated images of me online, probably, because uh, since I'm blind, I also don't take images of myself, understandably. And so, uh, yeah, if you need to know what I really look like, you can let, let me know. <laughs> Apart from that, so I, um, I've i been using Emacs for about three years. And um, the, wait, let me turn off uh, Emacs notifications so that I don't hear something talking as I'm talking. Yeah, so I've been using Emacs for about three years. It, it all started uh, when I had to take a booking.com in, uh, interview and I didn't have a laptop and I was going straight from Iran. So what I did was I just bought Parham, we've lost your sound. If you could please hold on one second. Okay, can you please try talking, Paro? Yeah. Okay, I, yes. I can Did hear you. Work? Yes, please continue. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so, so yeah, at, at some point I started using Emacs at Booking because uh, Booking does Perl, and Perl doesn't, is not the best language for um, someone who doesn't see. But anyway, um, that was when I started entering the Western world where you have to do a lot of, um, where you have to use a lot of applications like Jira, GitLab, uh, and some of that stuff wasn't accessible. Um, like Booking uses Workplace, which is Facebook's, like Facebook for work. Um, so I started meeting all of these inaccessible applications, but at the same time, I got introduced to Emacs. So let me tell you a bit about how blind people use um, the computer so that you know what I'm talking about. So um, with, um, with while, while you're trying to use a computer as someone who doesn't see, what happens is you end up um, um, needing an application to read the screen to you. Um, Parah, I'm sorry, can I interrupt one second? Yeah. Um, would you mind um, full screening your presentation window? Yeah. I think it's partly behind Thank another window right now. There. Okay. Did that? Yep. Make things that better? Did it. Yep. Thanks so much. Yay, 10 points. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> so, so, yeah, as you can see, I don't know where windows are. So, anyway, um, so when, when you are using a computer as a blind person, um, what happens is you need a uh, an application to tell you what's going on on the screen. So these are called screen readers. Screen readers have been around for many, many years on different platforms like Windows and Linux and Mac OS. But the problem is that they rely on the application that you're working with, like Chrome or Safari or um, Emacs or whatever, to, to give them information. So like these are APIs that the application has to implement to give I like some ideas about, okay, what control am I on? So is that a text box? Is that a check box? Is, is that a button? What's its state? Is it checked or unchecked? Is it activated or deactivated? And um, what's the content? So like in terms of text boxes and stuff like that, what is already in there? So what starts happening is if you do not provide these APIs properly, then the screen reader is pretty blind to use the pun. Um, so like then screen readers fail to provide any kind of information. So when I probably told you about like uh, developers need to provide APIs, you probably got some ideas of what could go wrong. And uh, one example of that is no labels. So like, for example, imagine you have buttons and um, the screen reader can tell that this is a button but it cannot really tell what that button does. So like if there is no, maybe there is an icon, 
maybe the developer didn't implement the label. So then the, the only thing that the screen reader tells the user is button. I just know you're on a button. I don't know what this button does. I have no clue. I don't know what this radio button or checkbox does. It could make your computer explode. We don't know. Um, that's problem number one. Problem number two is like not all developers implement the APIs to tell the screen reader what the type of the control is. So like, is that a button or is that a checkbox? And then like screen reader users usually hear unknown when they land on these stuff. Um, and then they also don't tell you the state, like is it checked or is it unchecked, stuff that I told you earlier. So basically you are at the mercy of the developer um, having implemented the right APIs here. And the third one, which is the worst one, is applications that have no keyboard access implemented. Um, now, this this is a bit easier for like brow like applications running in web browsers because um, it makes you slower when you don't have shortcuts. But like for desktop applications, for example, if Tab isn't working, which happens quite a lot, um, I pretty much have no way of um, uh, using it. So you might think, OK, so you're blind. You've been coding for a decade now. Can you just go all the, fix all these issues for yourself? And the answer to that is sometimes. Well, a few times, let's say. Uh, why is that? Well, mostly a lot of different applications use different libraries to provide user interfaces. So like, for example, we have GTK for on the Linux world. We have Qt. Um, we have like Coco and all of these stuff. And some of these frameworks like Qt are not accessible. So what happens, uh, well, I, let me say are not fully accessible. So what happens is if you have an application that's using Qt, and even if you even find the code and you have access to it, and this is like an open source application, um, if you go and, and edit it, um, there is a certain level that you can make it accessible to, and then at some point it fails. Um, so you need, it would be great if we had something that you could read the code to, like that you could add, have access to the source code. And then the framework that it specified, the framework that it used was fully accessible. That would be a great option, right? So you would think, um, how does this affect me in my daily life? Um, the, the first one is what I call the death by a million paper code. So like imagine if each application that you're using shaves off 10 seconds, uh, uh, like adds 10 seconds to a way that you would totally use it as a sighted person. Um, if I had to do 10 things with that application, that would be 100 seconds already. So that's mostly why when I'm working next to a person who's sighted, I have to try doubly hard to catch up with them. The second problem is the lack of control. As I mentioned earlier, and you probably noticed, um, as a blind person, you are pretty much in, um, in like you are relying on the developer to provide that functionality for you. If they don't provide it, if they are not educated as to the ways of accessibility and how to provide that, no matter how easy it is, they are not, you're not gonna be able to to use that application. And the examples of, of applications that um, are not currently accessible, I've listed some of them, but like you can actually see these are really uh, popular applications like IDs, Jira, like WorkChat and Workplace, which are like kind of like Facebook and Facebook Messenger. You have Google Docs and all of the like Google Suite and all of that. So um, all of these stuff take more and more time away from someone with a disability. <clears throat> so when I discuss this, most people ask me, well, why don't we just create software for the blind? Like just specific software specifically made for the blind. The problem with that is, um, well, first of all, this is not a scalable solution. So like imagine you can have an IntelliJ for people who can see an IntelliJ for people who can't see, um, an Amazon for people who can't see, and an Amazon for people who are blind, or an Amazon for people who have motor impairments, and an Amazon for people who have uh, like uh, mental issues, and all of that stuff, uh, is it becomes harder to maintain for companies. So the solution to all of this is 
we should make it easier to add accessibility to applications. There's been a lot of great work done about this by the web consortium, um, the W3C. Um, and there, there, so they've made it a lot easier for people developing web applications to make their applications accessible. And then the second thing is educating developers. A lot of developers think accessibility is a hard thing to add and a hard thing to, to develop, but we can totally tell them that it's just as easy as writing clean code. And the third one at a much wider level would be prioritizing accessibility in your products. The more you prioritize accessibility in your product, the more you can teach your users that accessibility matters. But what does any of that have to do with Emacs? So this is where things get super interesting because Emacs is not accessible in any term of the word. So like Emacs does not on Mac OS, for example, uh, implement any of the APIs that VoiceOver, which is the screen reader on the Mac, um, like it doesn't specify any of the APIs that VoiceOver can use. Um, but the really cool thing about Emacs is that it's customizable. So you can totally use Lisp to customize Emacs and you can totally use Lisp to, to pull out information. Like remember when I told you that we have controls that are like checkboxes, radio buttons and stuff like that. And then uh, you have like states, what, what are their states? Are they checked and unchecked? And then you have content like text boxes, like, like in a buffer in, in Emacs. So in Emacs, you can totally write Lisp code to pull out all of that information. And this is where Emacs Speak comes to play. Emacs Speak is a, um, a Lisp package for Emacs, um, and it allows me to use Emacs by um, using Emacs's um, functions to pull out information and then using the text-to-speech APIs on the operating system to speak all of that. So how does this work? For example, um, it uses advice, which are like hooks that you can run before or after functions uh, that can it can use to uh, hook into the Emacs functionality and then speaks out information. So as an example of that, when I press control N or down arrow to go to the next line, there is a hook that runs after next line, which is a function that gets called. So next line gets called and then Emacs speak gets called and then Emacs speak says, oh, what's the contents of the current line using the buffer substring function? And then it figures out the text and passes it to the text to speech API which is pretty cool because now I have access to Emacs from inside Emacs, which gives us some pretty cool stuff. And why is that pretty cool? So uh, one thing that Emacs we can do because it's running inside Emacs is convey if text is bold, italicized or um, underlined because it is running inside Emacs and it can actually like look at the line, look at the display properties of the line and be like, Ah, I can see this is bold, bold, so I can say it with a different voice or a different pitch. So that's super cool for like reading uh, books. Like I read EPUBs uh, and previously in any other format, I had problem understanding this because screen readers on other platform, uh, platforms are just unable to do this because most of the applications don't even provide this functionality. So the cool thing about Emacs running inside Emacs is that it can pull out that information and convey it in, in speech. So uh, one, one other thing that Emacs we can do because it's running inside Emacs is for example, when you're in org mode and one of the node, uh, nodes is collapsed, uh, it can play a note or, or a tone to say, hey, uh, this is collapsed. If you press tab now, you can um, see the, the subtree and like what's underneath this tree node. So that's a pretty cool idea that, that very few other software can do because usually a screen reader is, app like is, is uh, accessing the software from outside and not from inside. So that's a really cool idea that Emacs Speak um, can deliver just by how it's being run. And the, really th the third one, which is a really cool thing also is indentation. Uh, I use Kubernetes at my job like all the time and it, it relies on YAML. And YAML, if you have no way of knowing indentation, sucks. Um, so 
you will actually see me refer to YAML because YAML has some other problems, but we'll get to that later. But Emacs, because it's running inside Emacs again, it can tell me of the indentation of the line. So what if Emacs has something that is not accessible? An example of this is org capture. So like org capture, if you are not aware of or, or you don't know about that, is a really nifty thing. So imagine you're reading something on Emacs or on the web, and then you are like, like, oh, I should totally write this down somewhere. I should totally capture this link, or I should totally capture this idea that I had. And what happens is you press uh, the hotkey for org capture, and what ends up happening is it asks you, OK, what is this thing that you're trying to capture? Is it a to-do item? Is it a link? Or is it, um, I don't know, um, like a, just free text? And what you can do is you can just go into customize interface or like write some less code to add some more modes of capturing in there. So you can say, well, apart from to-dos, I sometimes want to capture um, links and they should go into this file called links.org under, I don't know, uh, inbox or whatever. So the weird thing with this is that org capture is using um, the, a function in Lisp that I completely forgot is called, uh, I think, read read key, keystroke or read key or something like that, which basically is it allows you to capture the next key pressed at, in your list code and do something based on that. And because this is capturing all of my keystrokes, it's, I am now unable to use Emacs speak at all. So when you're facing this in a normal application, what do you do? You email the, the developer and you're like, please, don't make my life horrible and make six, uh, like fix this bug. And what they do is they prioritize it if they care. They don't prioritize it if they don't care. But what you can do in Emacs is, or, or what I could do at the time was, I could use the org capture function because I'm like inside Emacs itself. And I could be like, OK, you know, when I press this button, go straight to capturing a to-do list. When I press this other button, this is just for capturing links and stuff like that. So oh, in- Parham, yes. sorry, uh, five minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, for, for any other application, that would have been very problematic, but because Emacs is awesome, that, would have, that was pretty easy. I'm going to speed up. How else does Emacs make me really productive? Um, so there are three things that I use Emacs for. Um, one of them is skimming. So remember that I mentioned YAML does a lot of indentation and stuff like that. On on a normal like in, in a normal application, what I had to do was go down and listen to indentation on every line to be able to get to what I want. Like let's say I'm at, on six spaces of indentation and I want to be at four spaces. Uh, what I would have to do is press down arrow, listen to the whole line, press down arrow, listen to the whole line, and stuff like that. Because Emacs allows me to code all of this stuff. What I do is I'm like, hey Emacs, find me the line that has four lines of four spaces of indentation, and just in like milliseconds, uh, Emacs lets me do something that would otherwise take me minutes to do. So this is my way of slowly catching up with skimming because like as you're looking at text with your eyes, you can skim really fast, but I can't. So that's one thing that I use Emacs for, skimming for me. I can ask Emacs, hey, can you pull up this relevant piece of information for me? And then that's a lot faster than me searching for it. Number two is I'm a team lead, which means I'm working on projects. People in my team are working on projects. And it, it sucks to keep track of all of this stuff if you don't have Emacs. Um, there is like other applications like OmniFocus, but again, they kind of work, kind of don't. So I use org mode really religiously all the time to keep track of, oh, I delegated this. This is the deadline for that. This person needs this by that time. Uh, we need to totally talk about this in the next meeting and stuff like that. And org mode, um, since I became a manager, I had to or use org mode like all the time. The really cool thing that Emacs can do and many, many other applications can't is it allows me to make other applications accessible. So for example, remember that I mentioned Jira is inaccessible or GitHub isn't the best when reviewing code. Um, Emacs allows me to write like list code that goes and calls those APIs and then shows me that relevant information. So that makes me a lot faster. 
So for example, for reviewing GitHub code, I, I use this package called GitHub Review, which allows me to just pull in the relevant parts without having to go through the GitHub interface. So what's my point? My point is Emacs is awesome. It really makes me do things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So please keep working on it. Please keep making it great. And please let, let us all um, enjoy your contributions and get to use them and have a much better life. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you, Parho, for your wonderful talk. It's always um, great to hear the the thoughts and aspects of how people do things um, in ways that are not necessarily the same as, um, as we do. So we are very grateful and thankful for you for sharing your uh, perspective and talk in EmacsConf. Um, one quick reminder for people to please consider, um, we, we really appreciate if you could use um, or refer to the operating system as GNU Linux or GNU slash Linux to give it um, equal credit to the GNU project for all their hard work, um, we would all appreciate it. Now, 